Okay. Well, I'm sorry. Can I get everyone's name and spelling really quick? Uh, mm-hmm. My name is Amy Vice. Um, V I C E. Kelby Lynn, L I N N is the last name. Robin Lynn, L I N N. I'm Jim Hall, H A L L. I guess just talk about the island. What's been going on lately? What feelings? What's happening? Um, I think we've gone through several stages of um, frustration. First, it was disbelief uh, that it would continue to go. We felt that there would be. Um, definitely an end in sight. Uh, we're not an island surrounded by oil, we're an island, that, an island that has gas rigs. So we don't have typically the results of oil rigs here on this area. Um, it's become a complete frustration as of May 1st. In our business, we have 118 vacation rentals. We make 75% of our entire revenues in the three months that we're going through business right now. Uh, we have had 228 cancellations in those five weeks and we are down to probably running in the range of 35 to 40 percent of our total annual revenues with just that short time. Uh, that's devastation. Then you have the impact of the BP claims process which is a joke at best. Um, they are putting partial payments out so there's a lot of people getting small checks the businesses that need larger checks to pay for their payroll, their overhead, uh, is getting nowhere. They're getting $5,000 against a $60,000 claim. Um, they change their stories every time you talk with them. And all this is documented, so uh, it, that's the reality. Those are the frustrations we're kind of facing down. The press, the perception, the stigma has been incredible in terms of pretty much destroying what could have been a, a positive season. We came into the year at 30, 35% for the first four months. We were 35% of our last year in terms of our, our improvements. We came into the year in the black for the first time since Hurricane Katrina. So we were all excited. I'm talking about every business on the island, in fact on the Gulf Coast, that we had one of the best years coming back at us than this. Um, don't know where we're going to go with it. Uh, the claims process is, as I said, impossible. We're very glad to see the $20 billion fund set up so that our own government can get between us and BP and we have a chance at getting a routine uh, payment back to help us get on through to them, to what we were supposed to be doing. Well, when I was talking to Mary, she said it's really June, July, and August. That that's a, that's so. correct. That's yeah. correct. That's it. And it's basically gone. I mean, we, we, we're even having people cancel in September, October, November. They're, they're Thanksgiving plans and Christmas plans and it's like we we have not been hit yet we and we say yet because we don't know we get a 72 hour forecast that's as far out as we can go that's as far as out as we can say with any certainty whether or not it's going to be safe or not to come here but I think canceling a vacation in October is taking things to a little extreme when hopefully this thing may be over by then I mean we don't know nobody knows but um and then we've, instead of the happy-go-lucky vacation island and tourist island, we're now the contractor island. And it's, it's a total different feel for us. And trying to raise a family here and trying to keep everything as normal as possible, on the human side, I mean, on that side, it's completely different. You know, it's like, Gracie, it's okay to come outside today. We don't smell fuel or whatever and we haven't smelled fuel in probably a week and a half two weeks so and um, you know they just opened our swimming waters again so now we can go in the water um, and that's what we do I mean we swim we fish and we s rent the island or sell the island we want people to enjoy us and um, the you know it's it's changed it's different so and somebody else anybody I mean, how is the mood how is the feeling on the island changed is it more of a somber tone it's very somber um, and from what I see it's very um, uptight um, you know I was commenting to a co-worker yesterday and I was like you know I'm finally able to live with the uncertainty you know it only took two months 
of not knowing what's going to happen and now that is our normal. I, I was talking to Robin, what, four, three weeks ago and I was like, what is normal and can we ever get back there having to go through something like this? Something that, you know, nobody knew anything like this could ever happen. And nobody had this in their nightmares. I mean, there was no way to know. So, and now we're having to deal with it and do it with as much grace and civility as possible. And um, that's been trying at best, so. When cancellations started coming in, how rapidly did they build? Um, our phone bill went up 30% just for cancellations. Incoming 800 calls. It started the first weekend of May. Yep. And um, our, our phone, we walked in that Monday morning and oh, our 52 phone. 52 messages. Yeah, 52 messages waiting for us to pick yeah. up in the morning. Um, and cancel. Our phone never stopped until probably a, a, a week ago, uh, this past Friday. Everything is canceled. So. And everything, basically the majority of our reservations are canceled. So we're not receiving the cancellation calls anymore. The phone has stopped ringing. We should be receiving calls for reservations. All we've received is cancellation calls. And um, it's, it's just, it's a completely different um, change of not only lifestyle but in the way of doing business on Dauphin Island. Um, we're, we're having to change gear and rewrite everything that we do. So how do you survive the next year? Yeah. Every, you make in June, July, and August to support for the rest of the year. How do you survive the rest of the year? We're an extended you? stay yeah, we've, for we've, contractors. We, we, have, we have, the only hook we have on the island right now, the only income potentials are the contractor base that's here. Um, they, are, they have staged on Dauphin Island because for all apparent reasons we were the farthest out and should have been impacted the hardest and the quickest, uh, besides Louisiana of course and coming this way. Uh, due to the currents coming out of Mobile Bay, at least that's what we're being told as part of it, uh, a lot of rain and you know the, all the rains that have been up the river system has actually helped put a current flow out that has kind of shifted it past us and it's hit the Orange Beach Gulf Shores. The problem with getting through financially is we have first had our hopes with all the BP promises. Uh, they were supposed to work on gross income, profit and loss statement. In other words, if we had a $30,000 profit last month or a year ago for this month, then we should, and only a $20,000, it would make up the difference. Uh, that apparently is not happening to very many of us at all. We, in our case, went ahead and applied for another SBA loan in order to keep cash flow be with the hope that they will get things correct with BP, that the federal government will step in between us, set up, be it the loan system or whatever, but BP is the guarantor on those loans. That's the route I think the $20 billion has come, that, that's come out of the uh, administration right now. Once they figure out how to administer it, whether it's through SBA or not, we don't know. But that's our hope. Because in six months, assuming I get the SBA loan, um, we do not see BPA st BP stepping up to this plate on this thing at all. About two months ago, when this first all happened, first word of this happening in Louisiana, did any of you have any thoughts that it would come out this way and it would have such an impact? Mm -hmm. Did you think it would? Um, uh, I don't. First, when, when, when the rig exploded, um, and then several days later they found out that the wellhead was leaking, um, I, I think at that point in time it, it hit us that we're at the head of the Gulf, we're in the Gulf of Mexico, um, we're a barrier island but we are populated, and, and um, I, I think that that's when it really first started to hit us. And then of course the panic set in with the crews coming onto the island, setting up all of the command centers. Um, uh, just a mass influx of workers being here. And we were kind of in a state of confusion, chaos. Occupation. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, we were, we, were, we were really frightened. And then, of course, the, 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 the phone call started with the cancellations because of the media coverage on it. And it, it's, it wasn't also necessarily negative coverage, but it's a negative perception um, of, of what's happening here. And, um, you know, our, our beaches, I did an interview, oh gosh, a couple, 
maybe the first week into um, when we were getting hit heavily with all of the news meter coming onto the island. And um, I did one uh, with a, a station out of Montgomery about how beautiful the beaches are. They're pristine, we haven't been impacted, the water is blue-green, come enjoy the beaches, and we continue to say that because our swimming advisories were lifted by the Alabama Department of Public Health yesterday. You can go in the water, it's clean, clear, blue. And, um, um, it's, and that the, the beaches are cleaner than they've ever been. That's, that's, that's the biggest frustration on our part is that people are canceling without actually seeing what is truly happening. They're just hearing about the oil spill. Let, since since you're, you're several states away from where you're presently sitting, let me let me explain where you are. You're on a, you're on a barrier island in the Gulf of Mexico, whose name is Dolphin Island, spelled D-A-U-P-H-I-N. Uh, it it has a very rich history uh, from the French, Spanish, British. Uh, it was a hotbed during the uh, uh, Civil War, so there's a lot of historic value to our little island. But our little island is, is uh, originally was only 14 miles long, very narrow, and Hurricane Katrina cut off seven miles of the island, which luckily for us was undeveloped. So we have a little seven mile island. There's approximately uh, 1,100 registered voters. Um, we are so small we don't even have a traffic light. Uh, and it's, it's it's a bedroom community and a semi-resort. And the beach houses that people come down and rent are, are homes that individuals own. They're not large corporations. There, there are uh, two small, two, well not small, there are two developments of condominiums and they're also rented. But there are days that even during the season one can walk on the beach and you may see one or two people. This is not like uh, Jones Beach in New Jersey, or uh, this is a very quiet, uh, good place to bring a book, Resort <coughs> Island. The sands on our beaches are, are sugar white. Uh, unlike uh, California or the Northeast, we have no stones, there's no coral, it's pure white sand. The only thing that ever really mars the sand would be seaweed or an occasional seagull <laughs> dropping by. <laughs> but that's where you are. You're, you're in a very quiet community. We're uh, three and a half miles offshore, connected by a, a three, mile, three and a half mile bridge. We're 25 miles south of the city of Mobile, which is a booming city. So we are the barrier island uh, that, that protects Mobile Bay from the surf. From, from the storms. But we are also not just a pile of sand, we're a, what's called a maritime forest in Mary Rock. And uh, if you look around, you can see a variety of fauna. And there's only a half a dozen maritime forest barrier islands in the continental United States, and you're on one of them. So we really have a very quiet, uh, beautiful little paradise. Very environmentally sensitive. Uh, environmentally sensitive. That, that is, I think, the biggest thing here. We have the birds. Uh, we are considered the birdiest community in, the, in America. That's actually through the Audubon uh, group. Uh, that's all real. The family uh, approach that Jim's talking about, we don't have water slides. We don't have things. We have bicycle paths. We have walks through the woods to see birds and things like that. And the families that come here, come here for generations. Um, we get a lot of tears, a lot of crying people who are canceling because they have to or they feel they have to. Um, frustrations are, are, are tough. We go from grief. We still try to laugh things off. We still try to look for a bright light. I don't know right now if we can see one at this point. We walk out the door every morning not knowing what we're going to hit in terms of the air quality. Yeah. Because you can smell it sometimes. And you know and it comes and goes and it comes and goes. It doesn't last long and um, or you'll walk outside and it's like woo, and you turn around, walk back in, and but it doesn't last long. Well, and we've had very few few days like that, but you, you know, still think about it when you go to open the door in the morning. I mean, my my morning routine now is check the bulletin board to make sure, 
you know, nothing happened overnight that I'm not aware of, check um, Facebook. And then um, go to NOAA website, check the 72-hour forecast. Go to Weather Underground, check currents, winds. You know, there's a whole new ritual to it to make to see what it's going to be and see what this monster is going to be doing so that then we can educate whoever calls and we can tell them, okay, you're safe to come down, you're good, da-da-da. And... Um, you know, they they canceled the um, the fishing rodeo. That's the third weekend of July. It's been going on since 1928. Seven. This would have been the 78th annual um, yeah. fishing rodeo. It's, it's called huge. the Alabama Deep Sea Fishing Rodeo. Huge. It's event. Huge. 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 And the whole island is completely rented for that period of time, of course, because it plus all the day trippers and all the people coming in to they spend an awful lot of money on the island. Um, that was probably the hardest hit to us was that loss of that one week. And they have never canceled before for anything. So, uh, there would be and that's three, the JCs that do it. Three thousand anglers. Yeah. Three thousand anglers. I don't know. I don't know. Over yes. the over the week time, uh, they estimated eighty thousand people came and went from the island during that uh, the the week of the fishing rodeo. It's I mean, and, and it's a, it's fishing. It's scientific. I mean, people come from all over the world to see what they're catching in the Gulf and. And the prizes, the wins are fantastic. The, the cause is fantastic. I mean, there's a lot of different yeah. um, things that it benefits in Mobile and then across the South. Uh, the so Sea Lab, Dolphin Island Dolphin Sea Island Lab. Dolphin Island Sea Lab, they, they come down and they have um, uh, their staff members come and they will, they will look at the different varieties of fish. They will, um, uh, don't they run tests yeah, on Yeah, they, they autopsy them and check for Do, all kinds of things. They tag so it's a, it's a them, very they, educational they thing as well. Very educational. They have a, a whole table and exhibit for hands-on with the kids so that the kids can see them up front and personal. Let, let me talk about seafood. <laughs> uh, the Gulf of Mexico uh, is exceptionally rich in, in uh, marine life. Uh, we, we don't eat frozen shrimp here. We eat fresh shrimp off the boat. Uh, when we eat oysters, we eat oysters that were taken from, from the waters mere days ago. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't buy frozen fish sticks, we, we eat fresh fillets. And uh, the fishing here is exceptional. If, if people in, where are you from, Indiana? If yeah. people from Indiana Illinois. knew how good the fishing was Illinois. down here. Illinois? I'm from Indiana. They're from Illinois. Oh, there you go. <laughs> If people from north of the Mason-Dixon line knew, <laughs> knew how, how, how wonderful the fishing was here, they, they would be down here all the time. Uh, uh, there, are, there are limits on certain species, such as snapper and, and trout, and uh, uh, what we call a ling, which is a cobia, uh, grouper. There are limits on them, and people always catch limits. The charter boats go out, and they fulfill their limits within the first two hours. But guess what? Since the oil spill, there is no more fishing. Well, they, they close is, the water is right after snapper season. I'm sorry. Since yeah, since the oil spill, there is there's no more fishing because, uh, I guess, the federal health people have said if there's oil in the water, thou shalt not catch fish. Well. That's not only the fish that are catchable now, that this, is, this oil spill is affecting the spawning and, and the, the procreation of the fish that we have and the rich seafood that we have. I'm not talking about just fish, I'm talking shrimp, I'm talking oysters. Um, the, the, the fishing very well may be gone from our Gulf of Mexico for the next 10 years. And you might add to that the new Jersey coast up to New England, the marlin fishing. The marlins spawn in Louisiana marshes and then they make the trek into the colder waters as they go up. Um, they're in total jeopardy as we speak right now. This yep. thing is huge compared to what anybody wants to make it in yeah. terms of the, da the damages. Let me go into that just a little bit more. The oil companies are putting what they call dispersants mm -hmm. into the water and into the leak. Uh, huge volumes of dispersants are being applied to the leak right at the site. And the dispersant does break up the oil some, but it also causes it to sink to the bottom. 
Well, the leak is in 5,000 feet of water. <clears throat> so who cares what sinks to the bottom in 5,000 feet of the water? Well, fact of the matter is, no one knows what harm that's going to do, even if it sits there. But we are also in a tropical zone, and when tropical weather systems come through, and, and the occasional hurricane, which everybody knows what a hurricane is. The, the, waters, the waters of the Gulf of Mexico are going to be mixed. So even if we do or do not have oil on our beaches today, what happens after a system comes through and water from 5,000 or 3,000 or 1,000 feet where the dispersant has been applied, water comes up to the surface and is spread around. So that's the reason I felt like and I'm no scientist, but there will be no fishing for the next several years, perhaps even 10 years, because the fish that are there are going to be killed. The appropriation and the spawning of all the species will be impossible. So what will it take to, to restock the Gulf of Mexico? This is not like a farm pond. And when can you even do it? And when can you even do it? But the dispersant is as much an enemy to us as the oil is because of the toxicity of the chemicals that they're putting into the environment. There, there are people who are checking every day, <coughs> excuse me, there are people checking every day from various universities and from various sci uh, scientific entities that are checking air samples, water samples at different depths. But society has never faced a disaster that we're living, that we're surrounded with that we breathe when we leave our houses in the morning. And this, is, this has never been experienced in our society. It, it's what the future holds is, is unpredictable. Our businesses are, are, you know, this business, our homes, our employment, everything is on this island. Too many eggs in one basket, possibly? Never thought so. But we're all really wondering what and where we're going to be in a year from now unless somehow we are made whole through this whole process. And I'm talking about just simply being allowed to continue to make a living. We're not talking about, well, let's get rich on this thing, you know, BP's got all the money. We're talking about trying to survive and earn what we were already in the process of earning just to keep our payroll in place, to keep things in place. Um, we're not asking for, for any more than what we already had. And we earned it. We work six days a week. We work hard, in my group anyway, and pretty much everybody on the island does. Um, other people chose their retirement here after, after years of working, and that's all thrown up in the air now. Uh, it, it's, it's beyond really any of us being able to get our arms around this thing. A hurricane comes, we come back, we look around, we count what we got to fix, we get on it, we fix it, and two to three months later, we're on our feet in one way or another. This thing we can't see an end to, we can't get our arms around it. I don't want to get my arms around it. I want it to stop. And we've got to get that type of pressure off of us because it's really messing everybody up. Now you both mentioned storm season. Hmm. What if another storm does come out before this is all resolved? Well, no. we don't know the consequences. Of course, what size storm? If it's a storm that goes across to Mexico um, or an Ike, the Dauph Dauphin Island is going to get whammed no matter what because we always see a surge and we always see the counterclockwise spin. If it's more of a direct type of hit, um, I don't know what the impact is with oil in the water, in the air. If it gets whipped up into mm -hmm. a froth, is this going to go right on up into Mobile, our houses? Now on the list of, is this going to be covered in oil when, when it all goes away? We don't know the consequences of that. Neither did the scientists or anyone else at this point in time. We just know it's a possibility. And it's a good possibility because we have a pretty active season going right now. What about the impact on your lives? What if there is another God forbid Katrina on top of this? What would it do to... Let, let, let me talk about this. Um, if there's oil on the beaches, or if there's oil within within uh, 25 or 50 miles of Dolphin Island, and a hurricane comes through, <coughs> and that heavy crude lands on our island and washes over the island, do we then become an entire community called a toxic dump? 
if the crude is like we see on television in the marshes of Louisiana covering our entire island, um, are we then a toxic dump? How do we live? Where, where, where do we go? Uh, real estate already has bottomed out worse than national numbers ever indicated. And if, if we have nothing to sell, what do we do then? But on the other hand, I have faith in Mother Nature. I think Mother Nature is, is, is very, very kind. And I think Mother Nature has taken care of petroleum products coming from beneath the surface of the earth for centuries. And uh, I feel that, that there is some hope. There is some hope for Mother Nature, but she can't do it by herself. We've got to help Mother Nature. And that's what we're desperately looking for now, is, is help for that unforeseen. The media. What we came down here as part of our reason, from what we saw, it seemed like everything was covered in oil. And we wanted to see for ourselves if that was the case or not. How is that affected? What are your thoughts on that? How the, that media, what's media, taken over, us media overstates, media overstates uh, uh, the situation. Well, that's not true. I can't say that. Well, when the media wants to find the worst example that that has to do with the issue at hand and display the worst example. Uh, I, I, right now, as of uh, June the 18th, uh, Louisiana has the worst example. Right now, our beaches are clean, but the media has created a stigma that that we're a sinking ship. And I have more faith that we're not. We're suffering, and we could very well sing, but the media uh, overstates our circumstances at the moment. But the media does not have the, the scientific knowledge to know what's coming tomorrow. That's what we're concerned about, what's coming tomorrow. Will that oil wash over our island? Will our houses, some of which that are elevated, for, for uh, flood insurance reasons, and some of the old ones that are not elevated, will we be covered with six inches of raw crude? What do you, you're from Indiana and, and Illinois. The press you've been seeing has us probably pretty much our beaches ruined, the dead birds and the oil. We're no different from Louisiana's to Perdido Pass, which is actually Gulf Shores and Orange Beach, but Perdido, Pensacola Beach, when the farther away you get, the more it gets sort of blended into one problem. Uh, and it's usually a problem unless they have been here and visited and know it personally. Uh, we're just part of a four state area that's being totally impacted by this. And obviously the worst conditions are the things that are being shown. Uh, there's no way honestly to counter press. We had through um, our PR guy for the town of Dolphin Island had indicated that over they did a study of what if we went out and bought the marketing time, the press time, uh, that has, was given to Dolphin Island in the first four weeks of this thing. If I'm not mistaken, and unofficially, it was about $7.5 million worth of marketing dollars that they could say, if we had bought that ad, this is what it would have cost. We have a $40,000 Chamber of Commerce budget. <laughs> That's an annual budget. So we have a little bit of trouble of trying to counter we have some BP money that supposedly has been put there with the state to be distributed down into the counties of Mobile and Baldwin. Uh, the question is, when do you take that $5 million, $1 million, and use it? I mean, do we want to run an ad now and say, hey, this week we're really good, get on down here? Or do you want to wait until we honestly have the well killed and the cleanup has begun and we actually see a pattern and a light that we can actually then start working. These are all decisions that, are, that have not yet been made. We don't know how to make them. The efforts, and that's something we do need to talk a little bit about. Um, in spite of all this, are we on? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I'm going to talk to the wall. In, in spite of all this, we are trying our, our, our darndest to stage things that can still be of a benefit to the island and are not directly beach related. Uh, one of the annual events that takes place, which Mary may have reference to you, was the uh, Junior Miss contest. America's Junior Miss. America's Junior Miss. Uh, 
We have had to stage that at Holiday Isle, which is a large condominium, because they have a, a, a pool area that, that is on the beach, because we did not know what the conditions at the beach were going to be. Now it looks like they picked a good, good weekend to have something, so we're trying to keep other events like that going on. Uh, we're trying to get some summer concerts established where we can bring people down, at least for day trips, to help the restaurants, uh, the t-shirt shops, and things that are down here. It won't help us with the vacation rental world, but uh, anything we can do to get the 20 or so businesses on this island still going in one way or another. Charter fishing, um, they have had some luck in hooking up with BP in terms of the um, vessels of opportunity. So some folks are at least getting their boat out, but they're also destroying their boats in the process. Uh, which is part of their choice you know, to, to do. But we are trying to create a positive image. We're trying to find inside island things to do. We're promoting the Sea Lab, Fort Gaines. We're promoting the bicycle paths, the Autobahns, the birds. Anything that is less than beach related. We've changed our advertising that we do in Birmingham News and around the area uh, to try to represent a little less beach and a little more substance to what other things we can find that we, we love on this island. So essentially it's been a, a, a redefining moment for you. To totally. redefine rather than, you know, you've been known for beaches, now it's, let's get together and figure out what's different about us. Yeah. Well, we've been defined for beaches, fishing, bird watching, and a small community. Now fishing is perhaps gone for a good while. The beaches are in good shape today and we hope they'll be in good shape tomorrow, but no one knows. No one knows what's, what that oil slick is gonna do. The bird watching, uh, bird watching is, is a really big thing for our little Dolphin Island because we're right smack dab in the middle of a path of migration from Yucatan Peninsula and Mexico and Cuba and Jamaica for the, for the tropical, neotropical birds going uh, north in the, uh, in the spring in April and going south in October. Now, if, if those birds start coming out from the continental United States and flying south and get down into this oil spill, they're not gonna make it to the Yucatan and to Mexico and Jamaica and Cuba. So the impact on, on uh, that, that section, uh, that, that group of environmental impacts is, has never been defined. Insidious. Going and going. I mean, it's not like, boom, you're hit. You know, with the hurricane, you can track it. You know when you're going to hit. You know when to evacuate. You're out of here. You come back. You're done. And with this, it's like, okay, we're not done yet. You just keep on stubbing your toe, at, you know, as you walk around trying to figure out what you're doing. I never thought I'd and slough off a hurricane. I know. <laughs> and true. And, and true. now it's like, that's so the piece true. of cake. This is this is something totally different. I mean, we have had to readjust, realign our lives, and this is our life, and this is our home. And, you know, it. I have a four and a half year old, and I want her to be able to go to the little red schoolhouse here. I want them to be able to keep the school open. I want the community to, to stay here. And, you know, if, God forbid, we were to have a hurricane and we would have oil on the island or crude on the island, then, Will they let us come back? I don't. I can't even go there. I mean, I don't. I don't talk about it, and I don't want to think about it. Um, but there's always that in the background that you do have to consider. What if that does happen? I don't know. We don't know. BP says there's no buyout plan. I don't no want to stay here. This yeah. is. I, I moved to be here. I didn't. I mean, we chose this, and um, I don't want to leave this. And um, it's scary, but you can't think about it. And bear in mind you, that you BP ad you guys are seeing on TV, the big BP ad, Tony Haver standing there saying, we are going to pay every legitimate claim. The pay every legitimate claim is the legal word that they have been using, whether it's a little guy sitting down here in our little claim center in Bayou La Battery in Louisiana. And according to the attorneys, that means we will pay as little as we can get by with and that needs to be thought about. BP is huge. This is a terrible problem for them and their company. But what they are doing is, at this point, already starting to evade the actual process and slowing it down, doing partial payments instead of making companies whole Token during the month. Token payments. Token at best. 
Well, and they change the process every yeah. day, too. Yeah. I mean, one day the National Guard will walk in with a list of things that companies and property owners need to provide. The next day, ADEM walks in with a list of... Completely different list. A list of things that somebody needs to provide. One, well, the first time it was BP claims adjusters that would come in with this. Second day was that, or second time was National Guard. Third time was ADEM. And uh, then we go or call, or a property owner goes and calls, and it's a totally new list. And then they put on these PR tents and air conditionings and weenie roast and all this other kind of crap. I don't care about a weenie roast. I would like to, anyway. Um, we it's don't, we will. totally different. I mean, they'll smile big, but they perform nothing, it's and exactly. they have done you, nothing. Let me tell you about the BP that personnel is the anger. rotation. Yeah. Then you oh, get yeah. into the let, anger of it. Amy, let me tell you about the yeah. BP personnel rotation. Every two weeks, well, they, they rotate to. them around, but the people who leave don't leave any records on what you or you have talked to, and the new person coming in says, bring me up to speed on this, or I need and repeat what you did 10 days earlier. So it's a ploy. It's, it's a tactic. Stall. It's a stall. And they're asking for information that truly, this is a foreign oil company. They have no business with my personal tax records. They have no business with my social security number. That has absolutely nothing to do with my proof of loss for the month. That is all the heck they need. But oh no, we have a homeowner right now, that one of the phones that was ringing here beside me, that was a homeowner that had put her house on a rental program. They are demanding that she gives her social security number. She's saying, no, I've been told it's optional. The head of the BP claims here, a guy named Paul, said, no, you must give us your social security number or the claim process will not go forward. Why does BP have any right to our personal business, including social security numbers? That's why it's gotta get the government between them and us. What kind of frustration does this create? I think it's displaying. I don't know. Am I reflecting anything? <laughs> what color is my face? And it's that's not the heat. Yeah. That's when you get away from I it. I mean, that, that's <laughs> when you try to, you know, step back, breathe a little bit, try not to get too angry, too frustrated, but you can't help but walk around with the anger either. And, you know, we talk about it. I don't, I'm not an angry person, and it's not my nature, and I don't want to be that way, and I don't want this to scar me. And I don't want this to change anybody that you know I know and I live with here and I and I love here. But it has changed people. There seems to be an arrogance in the oil industry from what we see of their chairman of chairman of the board and their various CEOs, and it's all the way down to the local level. Kelby mentioned to Paul, he's just two blocks down the street, but the arrogance is is. Uh, oozing from almost all of them yeah. and of course the statement about the small people didn't help and uh, I, I think that's done more damage to, to their image but what it does is it truly pictures their attitude. Well and the BP claims adjusters were the worst offenders of trying to get the top of the line housing for bottom of the line pricing and we were like, no, we cannot adjust those rates down to that. That's less than a snowbird rate or a January, February, March. We'll just open a claim on that. And I said, oh, you want me to open up a claim on you because you're not paying what you're supposed to be paying. They and her you can't do that. Tell and, her she, and her response was two of them that were in here trying to get housing for nothing, little to nothing, was, well, your island's going to be covered in oil anyway. Who the hell would want to come here? And they say Kelby, that? They they that. That. Kelby jumped across the desk Whoa. and said, out. Just get out of here. We don't need your business. And it happens. And then they try and disguise themselves when they call. Yeah, we're looking for housing. And I'm like, I know you are. But we're not offering it to you. Because we can't, I can't give them a $5,000 a month condo for 900 bucks. I can't do that. And still represent our get. owners. <laughs> And, and we're not going to get that difference. Neither is the owner or anybody else. They're just going to use their stall tactics. And, you know, the other contractors that come in here, they don't treat us that way. And it's like, how dare you? You know, you're the one that's messed us up, and then you're going to treat us this way. You're just going to keep on slapping us. Okay, now you don't want me to be angry, and you want me to accept your apology, and then you're going to call me a small person. No, it's not going to work. Fix it.
and the contractors, well, but I'm not angry. We're glad to have their business. We really are. But they are running on spring rates plus a 25% or so discount on top of that to get within their per diem. And we pricing. understand that. We understand that you kind of have to do that right now. But this is our prime season, or was our prime season, at prime rates. Now, we've been told, well, you just file a claim for the difference. We can't get past the first claim. So now we're going to have a claim upon a claim upon a claim upon a claim, and people who will just throw one roadblock after another after another. And then they wanted us to give them our renter information. Yeah, oh yeah, they need our, they our rental to be able to call to prove that it was truly a cancellation because of the oil I, I'm not giving out personal information. We can't. It's confidential. And, you know, it's not their business to have their address, their telephone number, their email address, or anything else. They just need to know that it's a cancellation. We're, we don't commit fraud like no. they do. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, we don't do that. We're not angry. No, we're not. <laughs> no. But I'm just glad my daughter can swim today. How do you explain so. this to your Why did Very, she swim? The smell in the air. How do you explain this? Very simply um some people made a really bad mistake they they didn't keep their eye on the ball they um were not paying attention you know how you always have to think about things that you're doing you always um have to pay attention you have to admit when you make a mistake you have to make it right um you know we talked about blowout preventers and we tried to describe it as What's best that we could blowout preventer mommy it's <laughs> just this little thing that they didn't have enough of and <laughs> It didn't work, but as simply as you can, and then, uh, you know, we we go into Mobile, you know, for preschool. There's not a preschool on the island, but we go into Mobile for preschool, and it's just, look at the flock of pelicans, Gracie. Look at this. Look at everything you see, and you, and you enjoy everything you see, and, you know, we name the birds. We name the fish. We, um, you do everything that you can. Um, Tim and, and Gracie, my husband and Gracie, they they camp every weekend. And it's like, let's just go spend time with nature. I mean, they're camping at the Dauphin Island Campground this weekend for Father's Day. And that's what they do now. And Did she tell that something has changed? She knows that some people made a really bad mistake and she's tired of it. And she's tired of mama working late. And um, she's tired of... Um, hearing about it because that's all anybody and everybody talks about but every um, adult around her you know I mean that's all it is she's and she that's is, the news and she's and incredibly astute as a lot of four and a half year olds are she's a sponge and I mean and she asks pertinent questions uh, she's not confused by it she, she's very much she's aware just, of things that I mean point blank on. fix it yeah that's all you got to do is fix it plug it up and make it stop mama make them make it stop okay We'll work on that. Yeah. And that's it. Isn't that family though? Just fix it. Just fix it. We can't go and we can't we can't we can't go any further if they don't. I mean it, it's gotta be stopped. That's got that's the first thing that's got to happen. They've got to stop that leak. Unfortunately we're all believing because of all the quote efforts they've been doing, they tried this, they tried that, they did this, they did that. Realities are it's it's the other wells that they're drilling which will be a mid-August hopefully and probably you know September range uh, was probably the only thing that they had in their pocket that had any chance of, of success. They have experience with it. Yeah, the other stuff they've been throwing out there to keep the American public and the world for, for what I know uh, to show look we are trying we're doing this we're doing that they probably probably would not have made any difference if they had just let the daggone thing go and keep working hard on getting those new wells in to blow it off and, and to cap it off to start working on the reasons for the safety and, and what happened. I'd like to see more skimmers out there. Oh, yeah. But, but because, I mean, I, I, from day one and, and started to learn more about how the booms work and stuff like that, you that was just BPPR just to make you feel good. We knew it wasn't going to work. It was like lipstick on a pig. It ain't going to work. And, you know, if you actually saw the skimmers out there and containing it and controlling it, then it would start making people feel a little better. But because they're using the dispersants, they're sinking the oil. And so we don't know what's going to come up or when. And that, that to me is, is scarier. I mean, you can see the oil slick. You don't know what's down below. 
and um, and you don't know the detriment that that it's going to cause. The, the boom, the booms, the booms are purely public relations. The booms are public relations that will amount to a mountain of trash when they're through with it. Have you ever thought about what Hazard. happens to the booms when they're through with them? Yeah. They have to be they have to be destroyed somehow. But the booms floating in the water rarely are six inches above the surface of the water. Well, what if a 12 inch wave comes along? Now they do hang down and the normal boom has a, has a round circular float on top and they have what they call a skirt that hangs down and normal booms are 18 inches and then there's a chain weight or some kind of anchor on the bottom of it. And so the, theoretically the oil that's on the surface is hanging on the surface with a certain thickness and it comes to that boom and it stops. But if there are waves, and guess what? We're an ocean, we have waves. The waves take the oil over the boom. Or wigs. So the, the skimmers, the skimmers, the, the big industrial skimmers are somewhat efficient, uh, but the booms are just public relations. So what do we need to take away from this? Is this a sign? Should we stop drilling for oil? Should we stop using oil? Evans, no. How did you get here today? I have a car and I have a house with electricity and You'll find air varied opinions on that on the porch. <laughs> this is where the porch comes in. This is where the porch comes in. Uh, you cannot turn the oil spigot off. You will have no. no society tomorrow if you turn the oil spigot off. That's very true. However, we do need to work extremely hard on alternative fuels. We now, have natural gas all around us. Not dirty, natural. Now in the air it can be dirty because it's got a poisonous value until they actually change it. But Natural gas has a lot of value to it, in our area particularly. We do not have natural gas on this island. We are surrounded by rigs that have solar. We have a lot of wind on this island. We have a lot of sun on this island. We have alternative choices if we want to push in terms of that development. It'll never replace and run a car. But Kelby, it's not developed. The solar power is, not, is not developed to an efficient to efficient state. Well, develop it it's not going so to get meantime, developed unless we put it. How are we going to drive back and forth to work? We have oil. <laughs> We have oil. We have oil. Uh, we need to put more effort into future development, R&D. We have oil. We can't stop drilling, Jim. I agree. We can't stop drilling. No, but we can We can stop drilling in waters that we do not know how to stop. That's, that's like setting up a nuclear plant for not knowing how to shut it down. You know, meltdowns happen. Chernobyl, three mile out, you know, three mile. We've got all these things. We can't get above where if our safety and technology on closing something off does not equal the ability to drill that far down, then that's out of balance. You don't go deep water drilling if you don't and don't have the technology to stop it at the bottom. But Kelby, I read the other day that there are over 3,000 deep water wells mm -hmm. and we have had an unfortunate accident. That's right. Gosh, I hate to defend the oil company. It really hurts. But there's when one unfortunate accident out of 3,000, and that's a rounded off number of deep water wells. Uh huh. And Atlanta, right just there, was it 35 miles away? With the even shoddier technology, they don't even have the blueprint. blueprint. Atlantis, the it's another deep water well built before the Deep Horizon well. Um, there are no blueprints on file. They're supposed to have complete safety blueprints on everything. They're not there. And this was told to in, by an engineer to the hearing, to, to the House of Representatives hearing, that those things are not in place. You can research it, it's called the Atlantis. We are all in agreement we got to have oil. We have obviously disagreements as to how much pressure needs to be put on drilling versus how much pressure needs to be put on alternative choices. And I think we need alternative choices. I think if That's alternative, my. I mean, if the, the thing with alternative choices is also if you can make it more convenient, affordable, insurable, then more people are going to be apt to use it. I mean, you can't necessarily insure solar panel panels down here because they'll blow off and so um you know but we've got wind we could i mean you could stick windmills out there on the gas rigs i mean they're there the platform's there just stick it on top of it do whatever i mean i don't know if you should broadcast that because i'm sure some scientist is going to go nuts and we've got to have one but jim's right about that i, I don't know where to drill. I think we could wean ourselves off of a lot of it. I, I mean, I don't Over think time. you have to have everything that people think they have to have. I mean, part of what's gotten us, now, us now into this trouble is greed. Now, I should and should no, not do. Uh, but, 
I think you could agree that a lot have, of what has put us in this situation and in this boat right now is just pure greed and the need to have the largest SUV and the I think and that we the, have the most wonderful society and the most wonderful too, country Jim. in the world. So do I. And we That's have, we have, we have conveniences and we have a lifestyle envied by the, who, who, who has ever tried to break out of the United States to go to another country? It's the other way around. They all want to well, be we're here. We're not questioning the quality of life we have. But you're, you're, you're accusing us of being greedy with our lifestyle. And that is, that is, that I, is propaganda well, that, is, that is being exaggerated to make a point. It's a I may agree with the point. I may agree with the point. But don't tell me I'm greedy because of my lifestyle. I take that personally. I, I now, let me get that back to drilling in deep water. You, you have no business being there if you can't stop it. You're not, or I'm not an engineer it. and you're not an engineer. There are over 3,000 deep water wells and we've had an unfortunate accident with one. God knows I lose sleep over it. But that doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't accuse the entire industry of ill will. I hate to defend the oil company. It just really hurts. But it's one accident out of whatever the number is. There's drilling in the North Sea. There's drilling in South Africa. And they required stronger security, stronger safety measures well, then look than to the our United government. States did because of the Oil Pollution Act of 1990. Then look to our government. Which was, oh, that's right, that's called the Bush-Cheney government in 1990. If we got a good for it, that is Texas. Well, I guess, oil. Like I guess the deep water horizon is Bush's fault. Um, no, the, the, lack of, the lack of safety on the bottom is because, and, and the, the MMS. This is where the porch goes after a certain amount of anyway, time. Anyway, the problem is we don't have an answer. We're back to the same situation. Yeah. We all have our own feelings about it. We're all frustrated about it. And we're all right about it. When you get right down to it, Jim's absolutely right. I, I drive that little thing. He drives that. No, you drive that. We have our different opinions of, of how we're trying to get there. I doubt I make a, an ant's difference just because I drive a Vespa compared to what Jim drives. Because I also have a Wrangler at home, so I'm doing the same darn thing. But we do have to do things smarter, we have to do things better, and I think it's all of them. I don't think it's one of them. We can't say no more oil, put a windmill on my scooter and I'm going to go solar panel. You can't do that. We all know we have to have oil. But we do have gas. Boone Pickens, follow his plans, they're pretty darn good. He knows what he's talking about, he's an oil guy. He has no stake in changing things over. There's a lot of choices. We just need to beef up those choices to give oil a run for its money. Yeah, so we've talked to three different groups of people here in Dolphin Island today, and every single group we talked to said they don't want a handout. It, when something like this happens, you have every right to kind of throw in the towel and say, I feel bad for myself. What's, what is it about the character of the people here that nobody wants to hand out and everybody wants to kind of, I don't know, it just seems amazing to me that nobody's... I think that's the character of people anywhere. I don't, I don't, I mean, I think the Gulf are strong people. I mean, I, I, I know we are. And, and we're good in adversity. We've been through it. We've been around it and everything. But I think anybody in this situation, I, I can't see that anybody in this situation would do anything less or anything better. I think, you know, most of the Gulf has handled this with grace, with the grace that the Gulf gives us. And, um, you know, we, we work. We don't mind working. That's what we do. And um, we don't want a handout, but we would like what's fair. And we want to make sure, and we're going to fight for what's fair and what's right. And, um, but I don't want to have to wait 30 years like they did with that some uh, Valdez with the settlements and everything. I mean, that, that's not right either. So, um, you know, that's my feelings about the Gulf. I think anybody, I think any region of the country would handle it with as much grace as what, what there is here. I do. There's always those that are going to try to take advantage of the system. I mean, that's been in, in large cities, if north has been here, it's been everywhere. There's always a fair amount of the population that, that's going to look for the easy ride. Um, and some have here. But you got, some have here. And they're everywhere. But yeah. you go across, you go to the fishermen, the, the shrimpers in Louisiana that I got the pleasure to meet a couple of weeks back. Those, those folks are doing what we're doing. They're working six days a week. 
but they do it because they love it and they do it because of their their sons and their generations are, are moving on it's something they've developed as a lifestyle it's not it's not oh today i'm going to sell cars tomorrow i think i'll sell real estate it's not that it's what the price to you pay to live in paradise and hopefully we'll be back to paradise we work hard for that privilege and that's that's the hardest thing uh we're not, I said we're not looking for a hand up. we want our life back and we want the life that, whether we were doing a good job at it or not, we want our life back. The fact of the matter is, our lifestyle has been changed from outside our control. We have, we have no control. We had no warning. And right now we have no solution. But well, well said, Amy. We, yeah. in, in, in our community, I, uh, I've tried to define my little community, but mm -hmm. people do work. This is not... Uh, there's 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 no welfare office on the island. Sure. Are there any positives that have come out of this entire situation? <laughs> That's a hard one. Think about it now. Wait a minute. We know we're strong. Yeah. And yeah. we know we can fight. And um, I think, I can't think of that I a lot of people of have um, rose above and have become leaders and. Um, better leaders and just more pillars of the community have shown. Um, I, I, th I think you just learn your strength and your faith in humanity and then hopefully things will start working the right way. The island so, has got a lot of, a lot of, uh, there's a, a lot, lot of, of the negative people. PR, but it's also gotten beginning to get a little bit of positive relations as well. We do talk, Jim brought up the beaches. Um, a lot of people still had a bad image from Dauphin Island of, after the hurricanes. We really got trashed because there were a lot of private ownership down here. They were crying for help to get the beach repaired, get their homes back and all of that. Uh, that debate could go on and on, but it was pretty typically uh, driven against the island. Since we've opened a lot of public access over, over time down here, um, and I believe the per like you brought up the whole purpose of this island as a barrier island has become pretty important. The fact that we do have the pristine sand, the fact that we are environmentally so sensitive, there are people that are going to see that side of things too. There was a wonderful article in the Birmingham News uh, that, that came out today, I guess, uh, which we'll be glad to get you a copy of that one inside that told the story of how Dauphin Island was really always kind of trashed and now all of a sudden everybody's starting to see backlash to what happens if something like this happens to this island. Um, that article kind of said it all in a, in a very well, I thought. So, there's not many positives. I guess none of us are having much more. I'm still thinking about it. I haven't come up with one. Yeah. Anything else any of you would like to add? Or? Well, for, for you folks in the mainland, uh, I, I think perhaps a, a definition of a barrier island might be in order, but in a large body of water such as the Gulf of Mexico or any of the, any of the oceans, barrier islands are, are a natural occurrence of nature in that there is a, in, in many places, a, a large sand bar, and that really keeps uh, the currents out in the deeper water, and it also keeps the waves from breaking on the mainland. And so barrier islands over centuries developed into to larger structures or larger sandbars. And so therefore the mainland behind them, uh, in this case, were separated by uh, the Mississippi Sound, which is a large body of water, and Mobile Bay. But we literally keep the surf from going into downtown Mobile. We literally keep the waves off of the bluffs in Baldwin County, which is on the eastern side of the bay. So the use of the word barrier island is very well described. Yeah, and we love it because we are on an island. It, has, it is a, a maritime forest island, so it's larger than a pile of sand. Uh, we have homes here. We have businesses here, we have churches here, we have eating places here, we have playgrounds, we have bike trails, uh, we have the wonders of nature, and that's what we're afraid we're going to lose. Yeah. Yeah. Okay.
and this is paradise. It's tough sometimes, but it's still paradise. 